friend, Sean. Sean and Zachary have been friends since middle school. Okay, Sean was getting, was getting married, and they have had the surprise that there's a baby coming before the wedding. But anyway, Zachary sends me a message, and he says, Mama, pray for Sean and his girlfriend. Sean had sent Zachary a text and said they were at the hospital, and there was things going wrong, and he said, Sean is not a Christian, but he sent word for Zachary to pray. Because Zachary has been talking to him since he has got saved. And that just, and Zachary, he says, Mama, he asked me to pray. And he said, I'm telling you to pray. And they did give, when they walked in, they gave him a 60 40 chance, which that's, that's good, but still it's scary. But um, they kept her the biggest part of the day. And as far as I know, she went home and everything is good. But it did something for Sean to reach out to Zachary. Because Zachary had told him that he had got, there was three of them, Aaron and Sean and Zachary. And Aaron goes to church and Zachary goes to church. And hopefully this is a step to bring Sean. Because he knew when he was faced with that decision, he knew what to, or to reach out to. And I'm sorry, but I just felt like I didn't do really wanted to share that. All right. The reading, if I can see it, is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, the majesty of your name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and nursing infants to give you praise. They silence your enemies who were seeking revenge. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place, what are mortals that you should think of us? Mere humans that you should care for us. <clears throat> For you made us only a little lower than God, and you crowned us with glory and honor. You put us in charge of everything you made, giving us authority <coughs> over all things, the sheep and the cattle and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our oh Lord, the majesty of your name fills the earth. And the New Testament reading is John chapter 16 verses 12 through 15, and if you would please stand for this one. Oh, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not be presenting His own ideas. He will be telling you what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by revealing to you whatever He receives from me. All that the Father has is mine. That is what I mean when I say that the Spirit will reveal to you whatever He receives from me. The Word of God for the people of God.
tongues of fire rested on their heads. And the fact that they moved out and spoke the word of God boldly in the temple and 3,000 were converted. I mean, that's what we generally remember about Pentecost Sunday. But really, it's best understood in the light of the analogy of the vine and the branches that you find in John's Gospel. Where Jesus talked about being the true vine and we are his branches. The branches are what are supposed to bear fruit. When the Holy Spirit came and did what he did in the upper room, those people were changed. And they changed the world around them. And that's the nature of the vine and the branches. I'd like for us to investigate that this morning, see the kinds of results. Uh, the natural question is, when you say that Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches, the natural question that follows the explanation that the branches are supposed to bear fruit is, what kind of fruit? And that's what Paul wrote in Galatians. Listen to these words. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. I did a whole series over the past couple of weeks in the uh, devotional that I sent out uh, on the fruit of the Spirit. We took one each day and talked about each of these nine different fruit of the Spirit. What, this, what I'd like for us to do is to explore the results. I'd like to explore the aftermath of what happened when the Holy Spirit came and touched those people. Beyond the 3,000 people that were converted immediately. How many of you have ever seen 3,000 people converted immediately? I mean, you know, at, at best, if, if half of you were unsaved, you know, we could get 20, right? Uh, but the point is, 3,000 saved in one day, but that's not the whole point. That was God's starting point. That was God's special work. And that happened so that the rest could happen. So that from that point on, the vine's branches would bear fruit. Let's see the results that came after Pentecost. Result number one is that there was a spiritual blessing. Now, fruit is a good thing. We call fruit a spiritual or spiritual fruit. We call it a spiritual blessing because that's what the Bible calls it. Spiritual food. And in this particular case, the fruit of spiritual blessing is supposed to satisfy the hunger that we have for the things of God. The spiritual hunger we have for the things of God. Are you hungry for the things of God? One thing I have noticed about young people that get saved, uh, I was thinking about Zachary was, as you were saying that, Debbie. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen that in his eyes ever since he got saved. He's got the hunger for the spiritual things of God's blessing. Sometimes when we have lived with the Lord and in the Lord and we've walked in the way for a long time, uh, somehow that vision gets dim for the things of God. Sometimes we get a little bored. Maybe church gets boring. Maybe uh, our daily devotional gets boring. Maybe, you know, there's just some things about church that kind of bore us. Reading the same old passages bores us. Listen, spiritual food the fruit of the Spirit, the spiritual blessing, is supposed to satisfy the hunger that we have. Food is always a touchy subject for those, I mean, physical food is always a touch, touchy subject for those of us in the Weight Watcher category. I don't know about you, but uh, the good news here is that the fruit of the Spirit is not fattening, it's not filled with cholesterol, it has no additives, no preservatives, preservatives or carcinogens, and the fruit of the Spirit will not make you grumpy or hyper or drunk or fat. It just might, however, the fruit of the Spirit just might, however, cause people to view us with a brand new appreciation for graciousness and goodness. Fruit is a gift from God, the spiritual blessing. In Ephesians chapter 1, it tells us that all praise to God belongs to Him because the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the, heaven, in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So, if you are truly united with Christ, if you are one of His branches in that vine, then God blesses you with spiritual gifts. 
Yeah, I've known people to say back to me when I say things like that, well, Pastor, I'm just an average guy, you know, I, I go to church and I, you know, sit in there and I, you know, I try to worship and I try to do what's right and try not to kick the old dogs and I try not to take anything that doesn't belong to me, but spiritual gifts, that, kinds of, that sounds kind of spooky to me. Well, spiritual gifts are themselves gifts from God. And the Bible tells us that when we are united in the vine as branches, then God gives us spiritual gifts. And there are a few things that we ought to do about these gifts. First of all, we need to uncover them. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 tells us, Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the spiritual abilities or gifts the Spirit gives. In the lives of many believers, these spiritual gifts or God-given abilities lie dormant. We need to uncover them. We need to rediscover them. And secondly, we need to understand them. Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Brothers and sisters, regarding your question about special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. Paul is saying, not only uncover the gifts and, and see what gifts are in our lives, what God has given us, but to understand them. Because as I said, spiritual gifts are not spooky things that you do in a trance. The gifts of the Spirit involve such things as teaching, as helping, as preaching, and mercy, and wisdom. Spiritual gifts are not merely abilities. They're talents and strengths and urgings that God gives in our lives because He wants to bless us, and He wants us to use those gifts for His glory. For instance, suppose your gift is mercy. You enjoy helping somebody out of a tough spot, you know? You see somebody in a tough spot, you say, well, I know what I can do about that, and you get to busy work good in that, right? You help that person out of the spot. Now, even though you enjoy it, your enjoyment is not the point. What is the real point is the person being helped, and therefore being helped, he learns to praise God for the answers. That's the point. It's a little like the faithfulness of one Debbie Sutton to witness to her son Zachary and others who came alongside and helped in that process. And Zachary learning, I hope Zach doesn't mind me saying these things, but Zach learning that he needed to thank God for all that came to him. And then with his spiritual gift of encouragement, speaking to his best friend, Sean, look what happened. A crisis came in Sean's life. And Sean may have thought Zachary was, you know, kind of going around the bend with all this Christian and church stuff. But guess what? When the crisis came, who did he call on? He called on Zachary to pray. And Zach knew where the fountainhead was in his life. He said, Mom, you need to pray. And guess what? That's going to pay off big fruit. That's where the vine starts to multiply, folks. So we need to understand the gifts as well as to uh, uncover the gifts. But then we also need to use them. And that's exactly what Zachary did here. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says, And the same is true for you, since you are so eager to have the special abilities, the gifts the Spirit gives. Seek those that will strengthen the whole church. Those gifts are not there for you to receive the applause of men. They are there for you to strengthen the ministry of the church. To strengthen the church is to build up other people. Our gifts are for the building of the kingdom of God. That means winning the lost and discipling the saved. And there's at least one other application to the building up of God's people besides the edification or the building up. There is also the reclamation. Sheep who have strayed need to be gathered back into the fold. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Paul writes to the church and he says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And... Be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Now listen, there is not a more difficult nor a more neglected use of spiritual gift in the body of Christ than the reclaiming of saints who have wandered away. And 
you know what one of the biggest problems is? You know why people leave churches? It's not necessarily because church is boring, because church can be that. If, if you haven't prepared yourself to receive a blessing, for instance, how many of you spent 20 minutes in prayer this morning asking God to bless everything about the service? If you haven't purposed in your heart that when you walk in there, you're not going to walk out until God has made a difference in your life. If you haven't come to church that way, if you just come to see what they got for me now, you're not going to be changed when you go out. And church is going to be relatively boring for you. And this is, it's hard to be delicate about this. There's no way to say this easily. Do you know why people leave church? It is generally because of the grouchy, temperamental wolves among the sheep. Case in point, young men who came to Christ early in our ministry, within a short month, this babe in Christ turned his back on Christ and walked out the door. Now I can repeat that story a hundred times over and I wouldn't have to use the same names. I've seen it over and over again. Because he sat in the wrong pew that sister so-and-so sat in for 50 years. Because he didn't do what they expected him to do. Because he was too exuberant. He wanted everything, you know, he, he, he wanted to know all about Christ. Oh, Pastor, explain this point. Oh, 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 I, I, I. People say, settle down. Sometimes the temperamental grouchy among us send the sheep away from the shepherd. Hard to be delicate about this, but those of us who are faithful have no right to be the cause of somebody else's loss of faith. Jesus said it would be better for that kind of person to have a big grinding stone tied around your neck and have you cast into the Uari River. Uari River, that's in the original text. <laughs> Meaning that it applies here. It applies to all of us. I have no right to be grouchy. I have no right to be temperamental. I have no right to act like a wolf among the sheep. Some folks have all the graciousness of a bulldog. And when we're offensive in spirit or in personality, it sends the opposite message of what Christ really intended. Genuine Holy Spirit fruit is a gracious fragrance. And you can tell quickly when you're around somebody who's indwelt and controlled by God's Holy Spirit. There's an atmosphere, there's an aura of Christ-likeness. In our first pastorate out of seminary, Macintosh's biggest industry was O.D. Huff's orange groves. The groves, most of the acreage of those, I think he had about 1,200 acres of orange grove, most of it uh, circled Orange Lake. And uh, as a result, most people thought that he owned the lake. But every Easter, in that tiny little community, population 253, I think. Um, every Easter we'd have a community sunrise service in the little clearing that overlooked the lake. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, as you turned onto the dirt path, you were surrounded by orange blossoms. And there was no mistake in that you had driven into O.D. Huff's groves. The fragrance was overwhelmingly sweet. The lake was still, and the air was always crisp at 5 o'clock in the morning. But I want to tell you something. You knew that you were there. And it's like that with love and joy and peace and gentleness. There is a sweet fragrance of God all around people who belong to Him in that special way. You may not be able to describe this adequately for a non-believer, but listen, you know it when you're near it, that special blessing. It's the kind of a thing that Sean knew about Zachary who cared for his soul, that made him ask for Zachary to pray for his loved one. A second re result that we see when the Holy Spirit enters the heart and life of a person is not only spiritual blessing, but numerical blessing. This is, uh, this is hard to say in a church that, by all accounts, has not grown in a long time. We have not grown numerically. Some people say that Methodists are too hung up on numbers. Uh, I mean, if there's more than one, we'll count it. We'll put it in a Sunday school class and we'll report the statistics to Charlotte, right? We'll, we'll do all of that. Uh, but the principles of bearing fruit help us understand that fruit always multiplies. 
And if he is the vine and we are the branches and we are to bear fruit, that fruit has to multiply. Otherwise, it's not really fruit. If you take a healthy vine, is Jesus healthy? Is, is all of Jesus' ideas right? If he, if he is, it, that means he's healthy as the vine. And he calls us to be the branches. And if we're spiritually healthy, what does that mean about fruit? We must bear fruit. And everything in nature tells us that fruit will multiply. And it all begins with the seed. Spiritually speaking, Jesus is the seed of Christianity. Paul called Jesus the first fruits of resurrection. You don't get fruit unless there's a vine. You don't get uh, fruit unless there's a branch. You don't get fruit unless there's a blossom on the branch. But when you do, it will always multiply. It will be more. The life of Jesus and, and, and what Jesus was in seed of Christianity, we must be in fruit if we truly to be His branches. The life of Jesus was filled with a seed of joy. What did it bear? Well, you can find Him at weddings and parties. What's not to like about that, right? Uh, he ate with the down and outers. He ate with the up and outers. Children came to Jesus. Sinners were forgiven. People were healed. That was the seed. What did Jesus do with that seed? He invested it in the lives of 12 followers and a bunch of other disciples who followed and a bunch of women who followed. And He was the seed and they became the branches that would bear fruit. And the law of the harvest says that you must sow the seed if you want to bear the fruit. How many of you have ever farmed? You know that in spring, that crop just planted itself, right? You didn't have to do a single thing. You just sat back and you watched uh, you know, Jerry Springer on TV and you, know, you got real comfortable and that, that crop grew all by itself. Now you know I'm being facetious here. You have to plant the seed if you want a crop, right? So the law of the harvest says you have to sow the seed in order to bear the fruit. It also decrees that you reap later than you sow. When you sow that seed, you didn't reap that afternoon. It is later. You reap later than you sow. But you always reap more than you sow. How many of you would be satisfied if you planted uh, one apple seed to grow an apple tree and it grew up, you waited 30 years, and in 30 years' time, that tree produced one apple? How many of you would be satisfied with that? Well, you could take that to the bank, couldn't you? I mean, all of your work, all of your waiting is what? It's absolutely wasted, wasted right? It, no value whatsoever. So you reap later than you sow. You reap more than you sow, but you definitely reap what you sow. If you plant apples, you're going to get apples. You plant corn, you're going to get corn. But listen, Jesus reaped spiritual fruit in the disciples that followed him because his seed was love, joy, peace, and so on and so forth. All those nine seeds were planted in his disciples. Now listen, numerical blessing applies to virtually every discipline of life. When the Spirit of God moves into the heart of man, the harvest will be plentiful. Our duty is simply to open the gates of our heart to let the seed be planted. That's our duty. And then a third result that we see when the Spirit of God moves into the heart of a people or a person, you see physical and mental wholeness. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 says it this way, a cheerful heart, good medicine, good medicine. On the other hand, a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Which would you rather have? Fruit, in the physical sense, sustains life, whether it's grain or, uh, you know, just actual apples and oranges or whatever. If you have a balanced diet, it's going to provide for the physical or nutritional needs of life. But listen, providing for those nutritional, the physical needs of life, also provides for the spiritual and emotional aspects of life. Um, because our mental and our physical being are so tied together, sometimes you just can't separate the one from the other. Balance is what we're looking for. Uh, if you're a person that never thinks, never uh, 
assesses your emotions, never looks inside and sees your spiritual condition, and all you do is eat all day long physical stuff, uh, you're kind of an unbalanced person. On the same track, person that sits there and just contemplates his navel 24-7, you know, and never bothers to eat and nourish his body physically, is also out of balance. We're looking for balance in life, and we certainly could use it. Uh, one of those things about balance is how we treat other people. You know, if all we are willing to do is be treated kindly and we don't treat other people kindly, we are out of balance, are we not? There was a lady who told the evangelist Billy Sunday that she had a bad temper, but that every time she lost it, it was over in just a minute. And Billy Sunday said to her, so is a shotgun, but it blows everything to pieces. That's the truth. I mean, and it does have lasting effects. In the, spirit, in the list of spiritual fruit is goodness. Now, this is not so much the act of being good or behaving oneself. Uh, those of you that know me uh, fairly well know that when I shake your hand, I'm liable to ask you if you're behaving yourself. Uh, have I ever asked you that? Uh, you'd be surprised at some of the answers I get. And there are funny answers because I ask it tongue in cheek, but there's something behind that. You know, the idea of goodness is an important thing, and it has to do with being good. It has to do with behaving oneself, but it's not all that. I'm going to give you a textbook definition, and then I'm going to tell you what the textbook definition means. Here's the textbook e e definition of goodness. It is the existential condition of inherent goodness without manifestations that affirm the inner being. Everybody say, huh? Uh, here's what William Barclay wrote about it. This is a lot simpler. Good through and through, and everybody can see it. To be good through and through, and everybody knows it. Everybody suspects that about you, but everybody really knows that about you. We need to be careful to allow God's Spirit to reign in all areas of our life. And that's where goodness comes in. If you struggle with temper, you struggle with grouchiness, you struggle with a critical spirit. Good, I didn't see anybody poke anybody else. But, uh, but if you struggle with those things, you know what the problem is? You are in control of that area of your life. Because God wouldn't act that way. Can you change? Yes, with the Spirit's help. With the Spirit's help. The Bible describes heaven and the fountainhead of the spiritual fruit that we've been talking about in Revelation chapter two, uh, 22. I want to just give you these two verses as we, as we end our worship service this morning. Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. John the Apostle is writing down what Jesus has told him about heaven. And he says to him, he's going to give him a picture of near the throne, near the castle of God, if you will, the throne room of God, and what it looks like. And John writes that on each side of the river, how many of you remember that there's a river that, that emanates from the throne of God? The Crystal River, remember that? Um, the church where I was ordained was in Crystal River, Florida. And I always think of that is, you know, the front room where my pastor, that golden voice, spoke to me. But uh, John writes, on each side of the river grew a tree of life. Not just one tree, groves of trees. A tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. How many of you have a tree like that in your yard? Every month is a new crop on it. Beautiful, wonderful. Then John says the leaves of the tree were used for medicine to heal the nations. Folks, this is where he makes all things new. This is where everything changes. This is where the fruit of the Spirit becomes such sustenance that it sustains us for eternity. The healing of the nations is a description here of the perfection of spiritual fruit, a perfect state of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Some people in this auditorium are going to partake of that fruit. When I say some, it's because I don't know that everybody is. I, I don't know that everybody in this room right now is saved. 
I can't look into your heart, only you can do that, and only Jesus can do that. Some people are going to partake of that fruit because it says that in Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. That's a symbol of becoming pure like Christ. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. What this tells me? This tells me that we can go to that harvest. We can participate in that. But there's one command that must be followed in order to have a right to that tree of life. It's what the scripture calls being born again. No one who has never been born again the second time, spiritually, will eat from that tree of life. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit of God comes into your life and gives spiritual blessing. It gives numerical influence and increase because fruit always multiplies. And when truly you become a branch on the true vine who is Jesus Christ, your fruit will multiply with physical and mental wholeness. This is the meaning of Pentecost. What happened last week at the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came to birth the church. To birth the church of Jesus Christ. Not of Latter-day Saints, but the church of Jesus Christ. And then after Pentecost, the result was the Spirit now lives in us to bear fruit in the world for the sake of the kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let the church say amen. Mm -hmm. Hymn number 61 follows the whole gamut of this Trinity Center. Come thou, Almighty King, help us by praise to sing. Number 61, let's stand and sing.